waiting a few extra minutes. Um, I'm Jason Diamond from Volume 1 Brooklyn. Uh, I'm the host of the event. You can yeah. clap for me. Um, so Volume 1 does a lot of these three-minute events, uh, maybe every like, two or three months or so. Uh, but this is kind of the one we've kind of felt the most uh, attachment to, because uh, I don't know if any of you read the website, but uh, we focus a lot on books, on film, on this and that, but at the heart of it, um, <clears throat> it's it's a punk rock site because we, the founders and the editors, a lot of us come from uh, punk rock backgrounds. We were in bands, we did zines, we set up shows when we were teenagers, uh, and you know, it's at the heart of everything we do, you know, we set up all of our events, we don't charge, which is important to us because you pay twenty, thirty dollars to go to events like this in New York sometimes, uh, and um, yeah, you know we really appreciate you guys all coming out uh, to this event tonight. So thank you. Uh, um, we have this sort of tradition where Volume One people sort of start off the night. So I am going to start off the night with a list of things I do and don't regret growing up punk rock. Uh, starting with number one, I don't regret not having sex with the girl who had a paid to come tattooed um, on her stomach when I was 17. I would probably be dead. I don't regret not getting a homemade avail tattoo when I was 16, because I'm Jewish, and Jews don't get tattoos. Uh, sorry, it's not true. I don't regret not throwing a bottle at a group of Nazis at a war zone show when I was 16, because I would have missed and the Nazis would have beat the shit out of me. I don't regret lying about having strep throat to get out of vandalizing a McDonald's when I was 17. <laughs> hey, Eric, can you turn this down a little tiny bit? Thank you. Um, I don't regret telling everybody how much I loved the Ice Age album last year. <laughs> uh, I do regret giving my Jawbreaker shirt to a high school girlfriend. I also regret giving a homemade Teen Generate shirt to a college girlfriend. I regret buying an infest patch from the clubhouse in Chicago and never sewing it onto anything. I don't regret the phase I went through where I went to shows wearing the cape, just the cape, that came with a scream mask. <laughs> uh, and I wrote down a list of the shows. Uh, the Botch Mile Marker American Heritage Show, two lightning bolt shows, and a Melt Banana Show. Uh, I do regret getting my ribs cracked at that Melt Banana Show by the bass player from Kung Fu Rick. Um, I don't remember it because I was already uh, taking a lot of painkillers for no reason. <laughs> uh, I do regret waking up two days later with blood all over the place. Um, and my roommate saying he thought I had died. Uh, I don't regret getting my ribs broken at another Mel Banana show in Miami two years later for calling the security guard a dick. Uh, I don't regret uh, declining Patty from Dillinger for his invite to do a toilet stand at punk rock bowling. I regret wearing a white belt. I don't regret punching my friend at an early Black Dice show after he asked me to do it because he heard they were going to punch him anyway. Uh, I regret not making better friends with Steve Aoki when he was a heart when he ran a hardcore label. He's a DJ. Yeah. I think he's got like a Grey Goose contract. Uh, I don't regret getting my car stolen when I went to go see Los Crudos on the south side of Chicago. Uh, I don't regret not going to the Chick Factor show tonight. Aww. I don't, no. Uh, and I don't regret projectile puking onto the guitar player of the kids at the reunion at South Paw a few years ago. That's all I got. I think that's all. Uh, but yeah, like I said, we. we we're really proud of, if you read volume one, we, we talk a lot about books, and then the next day we will have an interview with Jay Robbins uh, 
from Jawbox and Burning Airlines and all these great bands. And he'll talk about books with us. And then we'll talk to other bands we grew up liking or that we like now, and they'll talk about books. And it's really, it's really awesome to myself and everybody involved. So um, doing a punk rock night uh, is kind of the dream. Uh, and one of my co-conspirators on the site is my great managing editor, Tobias Carroll. with the first punk rock story, Tobias Carroll. Hello, everybody. Um, Hello. So I am going to very briefly record an anecdote that actually the first time Jason and I were in the same place was well over a decade ago, and it was um, it revolved around the the record label Trackstar Records, and they had a personal site. And uh, when I was probably like 20 and Jason was 18, apparently we were both on there. And then like 10 years later, this website called Celebrity uh, found their archives and sort of posted them up and hilarity ensued, uh, by which uh, there were pictures of me looking very, 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 very sad and what uh, Brian from Trackstar described at the time very accurately as a Cosby sweater. <laughs> uh, the handful of folks here who knew me back then I think will probably agree that that's an accurate description, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about the time I almost fucked up my friend's power violence 7-inch with my shitty backing vocals. And uh, here's the story. I don't think DIY is what first got me into punk rock, but it's what made it stick. The idea that you could be part of a scene, that you could make something of your own without anyone checking your credentials or level of experience, that appealed to me. After going to hardcore shows for a few years, I realized that I wanted to get more involved in, yes, I'm gonna go there right now, the scene. <laughs> I ended up doing a zine, but there was still a part of me that wanted to be involved in making music somehow. I didn't play any instruments, so that left vocals as the only option. <laughs> I've known people who can contort their throats and emit aggrieved shouts that perfectly match the furious music behind them. I did not believe myself to be capable of this. Still, stranger things had happened. In November of 2000, I got a call from my friend Wukash telling me that his band Toshiro Mifune would be visiting New York City from Boston to record a 7-inch at the studio at WNYU. He also posed a question. Would I be interested, perhaps, in contributing backing vocals to one of those songs? Yes, I said. I would be very interested. <laughs> Power violence is a style of hardcore that is exactly what the name suggests. <laughs> Even by the standards of hardcore, fast and unrelenting, power violence can sound extreme and can be almost comically fast. The Possessed to Skate compilation, for instance, fit 41 songs across the two sides of an LP. The complete discography of the band Charles Bronson fits 117 songs across a pair of CDs, 96 of them on the first one. Toshiro Mufune's plan was to record seven songs, six for a seven inch and one to go on a compilation released by the same label, Deep Six Records. I showed up that evening, the sun already set, and made my way to the studio, greeting the members of the band and the guy engineering their session. Most of the music had been recorded earlier in the day, and by the time I had arrived, little was left to do but record the vocals. It was here that I realized that I had no idea what any of these songs sounded like. I hadn't thought to ask for demos or practice tapes or anything that might have given me an idea of what to expect. Still, I thought I could manage this, even as I ignored the nervous tension that grew between my shoulders and sapped the moisture from my mouth. For the first take, Wukash handed me some lyrics and gave me a cue. When I sing that, he told me, you sing this. I said, fine. And as I stood there, microphone in front of me, about to realize a long-standing ambition, I became utterly terrified. Every iota of moisture in my throat drained away as the playback began through the headphones. The nervous feeling that flooded my body brought back flashbacks of the first time I took my driving test seven years earlier, under the careful watch of a terrifying man who I was convinced was about to stab me with a hook. <laughs> 
I had failed that test in spectacular fashion. <laughs> this did not bode well. Wukash screamed his lyrics. I reached my cue. I opened my mouth, and what came out was a sort of guttural shout, an echo of some post-apocalyptic language designed to be heard over the howls of mutated rats and feral kittens. The lyrics I was supposed to be singing were hardly discernible, but neither was it proper screaming for the sake of screaming. We did a second take. This time with me asked to sing half the lyrics I'd originally been given. <laughs> my throat was even more dry now. My fear that I was not only botching my own goal, but ruining their session growing exponentially. We returned for take three. Wukash took me aside. When I sing this section, he said, just scream. <laughs> All right, I said. The scream is backing vocal had a long and storied history in hardcore. I could certainly scream, I thought. At no point in this did I ask for a glass of water. <laughs> At no point in this did I ask for a break to go to a water fountain or to visit the bathroom, cup water in my hands, and force it down my throat. Instead, I returned in stalwart fashion to the microphone and waited for my cue. What emerged from me in that third and final take didn't really resemble anything one could hear in a punk, metal, or hardcore song of note. The song cut to tape was closer in tone by the terrified shouts made by Peter Boyle's reanimated character in the film Young Frankenstein <laughs> upon his first glimpse of fire. My roommate at the time kindly said that the vocals had kind of a man is the bastard thing going on. I suspect that he was being kind. Dejected, I hung around the studio awkwardly for another few minutes, then slowly made my way to a friend's birthday party a few blocks away at Ace Bar. The following Monday, I emailed Wukash, please don't use my backing vocals I wrote. They sounded awful. Don't worry, he replied. They did, but were not. <laughs> Thus relieved that my shameful attempt at hardcore vocals would vanish into the ether, the nut of tension that had left my throat dry and my brain prevented from picking up on musical cues dissolved. A few weeks later, a CDR arrived in the mail featuring the rough mixes of the seven songs. I loaded it into my CD player and began listening to it as I checked my email. Seven songs passed and I glanced up and looked over at the player, saw an eighth track playing, and knew it was coming. <laughs> a naked shout repeated three times, sounding more like an angry giant than righteous fury yoked to a blast beat. And while it might not have laid the groundwork for me as the hardcore vocalist of the future, it has over the years become several friends' ringtone of choice. <laughs> not the most punk rock fate in the world, admittedly, but the utilitarian in me is pleased. That's not too far removed from DIY when it comes down to it. Woo!